many times, expanding our workforce and making sure Vermonters have the skills they need for the good jobs we know are available today is incredibly important to our economic future. We know we have a good education system here in Vermont, and I believe we can make it the very best by moving to a cradle-to-career system that creates a path to opportunity for all Vermonters. If we can, it'll be the best economic development tool we could ask for. To get there, we must continue to make investments in early care and learning, as well as higher and continuing education. This is why I propose increased investments in both areas, and I'm very thankful for the legislature's partnership on many of these initiatives. Together, we focus on trades training and apprenticeships, returnships and non-degree programs, even focus, each, each and every one of them, focus on providing tools to pursue a good job and greater career opportunities. But today, I'd like to highlight what some of Vermont businesses and our higher education community are doing to provide much needed training and educational opportunities. With the unemployment rate at the historic low, in fact, the lowest in the country at 2.1 percent, Vermont companies are seeking new ways to recruit and train employees. Vermont Tech and CCV partner with businesses and organizations across the state to develop and offer training program, pro programs uh, tailored to the needs of uh, employers that you'll hear from today. Workers have an unprecedented opportunity to take advantage of these training programs and access great jobs with quality employers. Jobs that not only pay well, but also offer benefits such as paid time off, health insurance, and a pathway to progress. CCV works with employers to understand their needs and workforce training that's available to them. They've developed nearly a dozen new programs in recent years with offerings from a single course for employers uh, at, at a work site or, and, uh, or to a group of employers and community organizations all working together to identify, find, and train new workers. VTC has partnerships with many employers across Vermont, New Hampshire, and upstate New York. And they have at, had success with employer-specific customized training. VTC also oversees the electrical and plumbing apprenticeship program in partnership with our Department of Labor. In fact, this year's uh, class just kicked off on Saturday, and I understand it's the largest class ever, which is great to hear because as someone who's spent much of my life in the trades, I know we're in desperate need, with the average age of a construction worker at about 56 years old. I want to thank Joyce Judy, president of CCV, and Pat Moulton, president of VTC, for joining us today and we'll hear more from them in just a bit. The bottom line is we have many great companies with good jobs available and are partnering with training providers like CCV and VTC to offer real opportunities for Vermonters. I'm hoping we can learn a little bit more about these opportunities today, share this news, and help someone looking for the right training program or a new career. We have a few guests here as well, and some students with us from Global Foundries, GW Plastics, Central Vermont Medical Center, and McDonald's to talk about these training and educational opportunities and how they're impacting our state. So I'm pleased to welcome everyone here today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Judy and President Moulton to talk a little bit more about their role in this important process. Joyce, Pat. Thank you, Governor. And um, I want to just begin by acknowledging and thanking the Governor for his um, tremendous support of the Vermont State Colleges. He has really taken um, the initiative to really help begin to increase um, appropriation, which makes it um, that much higher education that much more affordable to Vermonters. So thank you so much for your leadership in that. Um, you know, as Governor Scott was talking, you know, I was reflecting on all of the programs and certificates and apprenticeships and customized trainings that um, CCV offers in our 12 locations and our online programs throughout the state. And in addition to that, we are doing more and more on-site with businesses um, where, stu where employees can actually take courses um, while they are at their place of employment. But I want to begin by saying we couldn't do this work alone. And I want to thank our and acknowledge our incredible partners 
the Vermont Department of Labor, the Agency of Education, Vocational Rehabilitation, Creative Workforce Solutions, VSAC, the technical centers, the high schools, um, and Vermont Technical College. Because without all of us working together on this, um, on really trying to create um, workforce programs, we couldn't do this as well. So I think together we offer Vermonters and Vermont businesses the space to think of what's possible and then how to get there and get it done. So I just want to highlight a couple programs that really illustrate our work that we're doing. So this past summer, we partnered with Workforce Opportunity Solutions, and they had contracted with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to really help them build a pipeline of workers. And so Workforce Opportunity Solutions has a track record and a mission to provide training and, un and em un employment opportunities to underserved youth and veterans. And through their efforts and classes taken at CCV this summer, there were nine new employees at Blue Cross Blue Shield in jobs from medical claims to project management in just a few, few short months. And then um, we're, we've just launched um, a couple weeks ago um, a pharmacy technician apprenticeship program. So a few months ago, CVS came to us and said, we have a huge need in the state of Vermont for pharmacy techs and can't you help us provide that training? So as a result of conversations, we were able to launch a pharmacy tech apprenticeship program. We started that program um, 10 days ago. We have 14 participants statewide. And what's nice about apprenticeships is it's a model where people get to earn and learn at the same time. So we have a number of pharmacies from Smiling Steve's Pharmacy, which has three locations in Rutland, Ludlow, and Springfield, to CVS, to Walgreens, and Shaw's throughout the state of Vermont, all employing these individuals as they are going to school. So it's a huge, it's a win-win. It's a win for, first for the participants, it's a win for the uh, businesses, and it's a win for CCV. So these are just a couple of examples of the things that we're doing, um, and it's a pretty exciting time um, in terms of really thinking about all the possibilities we can do with, um, in our work with the Vermont businesses. So Pat, I know you have a couple of programs to highlight as well. Right. <clears throat> thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Governor Scott. And I, too, want to take this moment to thank you for your continued support of the state colleges, but also the work you mentioned earlier in bolstering funding for workforce education and training programs, because we couldn't do what we do for employers without that assistance. So thank you for your leadership there. And I think we all know that Vermont Technical College is well known for providing great degrees in technical education, our 99% placement rate of graduates. But what folks may not know is that we are leading, along with CCV, in the area of customized training for employers. And we provide solutions that bring workforce education solutions to the employer, as well as on our campuses. Companies and employers like Global Foundries, who you'll hear from, GW Plastics, who you'll hear from, GS Precision, Fujifilm, GAE, GE Aviation, Central Vermont Medical Center, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, numerous other healthcare facilities, manufacturing, energy, and many, many other firms are engaged with us in customized training. We provide apprenticeship programs as well as specific customized to their needs. And these employers are investing in their talent pipeline by bringing training and education onto their shop floor or into their workplace. And we customize these solutions to meet their specific needs. And these solutions can carry college credit so that these students, these incumbent workers and new hires can earn a degree through this work, starting with their employer, whether they already have certain credits or already have a degree, they can augment that. And these employers recognize that their employees are their number one asset, and they are investing in them. And it is a real win-win for these employees and employers and the Vermont workforce when employers are investing in their talent pipeline. Many times programs such as the Vermont Training Program from the Agency of Commerce or the Workforce Education and Training Fund or other federal funds from the Department of Labor are utilized to help offset these costs for employers. But by employers putting skin in the game and investing in their talent, it's really critical for them to do that as we continue through the workforce challenges we have here in Vermont. And at Vermont Tech and CCV, we are uniquely situated to develop those workforce education and training solutions that we can bring to employers throughout the state of Vermont. 
and we can literally do almost any configuration you wish. We work very closely through our continuing ed and workforce development division. Maureen Hebert is our director. She's here today. She and Tiffany Kunin from CCV partner all the time to figure how we can collaborate together to serve the workforce needs. So it's my pleasure to be here today and thank you for the opportunity to highlight this. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dale Miller, who is the Senior Location Executive for Global Foundries in Essex Junction, and I would note a Vermont Technical College graduate. <laughs> so, Dale, please come to the podium. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, President Moulton and President Judy. Uh, at Global Foundries, we're proud to continue and further our relationship with Vermont Technical College. We are grateful to Governor Scott for his support of public resources, including the state college system. This technician training program with Vermont Technical College allows Global Foundries to further its talent pipeline and continue to thrive in the state of Vermont as a leading specialty foundry and innovation hub for mobile and consumer products. We are excited to bring this program to our community to help support building a Vermont-based technical workforce. Our first class of 15 students started August 28th. They are earning a full-time wage and attending college-based courses while being trained internally at our Global Foundries Complex in technical applications such as vacuum and radio frequency systems along with basic maintenance skills. I'm happy to report that we are beginning the recruiting process for our second class starting in the fall of 2020. I would also like to recognize a couple colleagues here with me today, Ken McCavey and John Lafreniere, which really spearheaded this process uh, and made it happen for us in, in Vermont, working with Vermont Technical College. I would now like to introduce Kevin Locke from GW Plastics. Thank you. As Dale said, my name is Kevin Locke. I'm a manufacturing quality engineer from GW Plastics. My story is six years ago, I chose to make a career change in a field that I had zero experience and minimal knowledge. That's very intimidating. And by being able to enroll in this program, I was able to get the education that helped me every single day with what I do. And it enhanced the learning every single day. My job performance increased. I was able to get a promotion, raises, and it opened up the opportunity for career growth. Throughout this four-year program, like Dale said, we go to school, we go to work every day, you have your family. It makes it reasonable to obtain uh, a certificate and you're able to you know, have confidence in your job performance at work. Throughout the four years, you, you learn a lot and at the end you have to put together projects or you have to use everything that you learned and we were able to put a project together where we created cost savings for the company, a yearly cost savings. And that's, those are the things that it opened up for me and having zero experience, now I'm confident every single day with what I do, where I'm at and when I'm communicating with people at work. Thank you. So now Jesse Anderson from McDonald's. Hi everyone, my name is Jesse Anderson and I moved to South Burlington, Vermont in 2014 from my home country, Liberia. My family moved to the U.S. specifically to provide a better education platform for my siblings and I and to be closer to family. I graduated from South Burlington High School in 2017 and decided to further pursue my higher education at St. Michael's College. As a first generation college student, education means a lot to my family and I because it provides an opportunity to be independent and grow. But paying for education is difficult. I receive aid from the state of Vermont to attend college through the Vermont Student Assistance Cooperation Grant, VSAC. Um, but attendance in Mike's is still expensive. So I still have to work almost full time on and off campus, but on campus I work as a resident assistant in the international housing and off campus I work at McDonald's as a certified manager. Advancing my leadership skills at McDonald's has not only helped me gain a significant pay raise, but I've also received $6,000 in the Archway to Opportunity 
tuition assistance program. I anticipate getting $12,000 in total by the time I graduate college. Getting this much help through the Archway Opportunities Program has made a significant difference in my life and not only taking some financial burdens off my shoulders, but, but also allowing me to grow towards my career goals. I aspire to be a clinical psychologist someday, and I'm a, currently a junior psychology major with minors in philosophy and religious studies. The help I get from the Archways program at McDonald's has allowed me to not have to work all the time, but also give back to my college community by being the president of a club that creates a safe space on campus for women to connect and talk to each other. I plan on staying in Vermont after I graduate to pursue my career in psychology, and I know that my McDonald's family will always have my back. Thank you. I would not like to. I would now like to introduce Sydney Konopka, who is a current nursing student at the Central Vermont Medical Center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so hello everyone, I'm Sydney. I'm currently an employee at Central Vermont Medical Center at Woodbridge. And I'm also in the LNA to LPN program uh, with CVMC and CCV in Vermont Tech. I actually moved here from New Jersey five years ago after visiting family and received my LNA license in the nor Northeast Kingdom where I live now. Still getting used to the winners. <laughs> Through a friend of mine who also works for CVMC, I learned about Woodridge Rehabilitation and Nursing and she told me all about their great benefits and opportunities. Plus I'd be able to use more of my LNA skills. I have now been an employee at CVMC's Woodridge for almost three years. At Woodridge Rehab, I see a lot of people come in at their worst, and I'm able to provide them with the help and stronger to get stronger and independent again to go home. It is really, truly a rewarding job. So when I heard about CVMC offering the LNA to LPM program from our director of nursing last year, I was truly excited. Myself and 17 others who are also in this program started taking uh, two classes the beginning of this month. So we're just started. <laughs> um, CVMC has also made the classes very convenient for us by having our classes at the hospital and Woodridge has really been great with our schedule. Um, as an LNA wanting to grow and provide more care to the patients I take care of and further my career, this program really helps me to do so by providing financial support and that's what's most important to me. With that being said, I'd like to thank CVMC and Woodridge for this great opportunity and all the support that they provide me. Thank you so much, and thank you, Governor Scott. Thank you very much. So at this point, uh, we can open up for questions, maybe on-topic questions at the at first. Joyce or Pat, when a company comes Come to you and says, hey, uh, we have these jobs, maybe we could develop a customized curriculum to fill them. Are they contributing any uh, money to you to help you get that going? It all, I'm now I'm gonna sound like a lawyer and I'm not a lawyer, it all depends. Um, <laughs> you know, and oftentimes, like I will use an example of the Central Mont Hospital. Um, it's a combination of we were able to get, um, we have a federal grant with the Department of Labor, um, a federal apprenticeship grant and so some of the funding is picked up by the apprenticeship program. Um, Central Mont Hospital is contracting for a couple of the courses and um, students are also eligible for, for financial aid. So it's oftentimes a combination of, or from the Vermont training program, there's sometimes state sort of resources, sometimes there's federal resources, sometimes it's straight financial aid, and sometimes we also, if a company contracts with us for a course, we oftentimes will give them a discount for that course. So it's usually, we try to pull all the resources we can together to make it as inexpensive as we possibly can for the participant. Well, and, and same with us, it's gonna depend on the program, but um, usually there is skin in the game, if you will, from the employer. I'm just looking as an example at the GW Plastics program that Kevin graduated from. It's a leadership program, four years as he stated, where students are going to school 
in the, in, at their workplace and GW releases them a little early, still paid to go to classes, then GW is f covering the full cost of our faculty going down to teach that class. They also provide scholarship opportunities for our students enrolled in our degree programs and provide paid internships in the summer. And so <clears throat> that kind of participation and assistance that we have with a number of employer partners is critical. Then we have other programs that might blend some Vermont training program money. We also have access and are a partner with VDAL on the federal apprenticeship program uh, grant. So it's a mixture depending on what the circumstance is. But more and more GS Precision and Brattleboro as well as GW have set up their own training center on their own nickel. They're paying the full cost of the apprenticeship program that's happening there. Same with GE. So it depends. And, and similarly with the hospitals, they're picking up the cost to train their employees and giving release time many times and providing scholarship for those students to continue on to a degree. So it's quite an investment, but it's an investment that's paying off. I will, I will quote Ben Real, CEO at GW Plastics the other day that said, but for Vermont Technical College, they probably wouldn't be growing in Vermont if they were still here because they need to know there's a pipeline of students coming out of these of our colleges to support their needs. Thanks. Governor, are these programs you think are they enough to uh, solve the <coughs> labor shortage? Well, obviously, uh, they're just one tool in the toolbox. Um, we have to we have to attack this at many different levels uh, uh, with many different uh, initiatives, and we've done that. Uh, through the legislative process. The good news is uh, it appears we all understand that we have a demographic crisis on our hands. Uh, so it, uh, it, it's great uh, that uh, the legislature as well as the administration and, and our business partners and the, and the educational community are all working towards the same goal and trying to bring more people into Vermont uh, as well as giving them the, the tools they need to succeed. So um, one, one of the tools, this one, uh, doesn't do it alone. Uh, but it certainly is a, a big help uh, in moving us towards and uh, moving uh, those who who want to progress uh, towards prosperity. How um, uh, many are involved? You think in, in sort of these workforce improvement training programs through uh, either the state colleges or VTC? How many individuals? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yep. is this still pretty? Uh, I'm, I'm, going going to, I'm going to go back to. <laughs> well, I will, I, I will just say that people come to CCV for two reasons. One, they come either to start their education and transfer to another school, or they come to CCV to get a job. We have over 5,000 students enrolled this semester. So, you know, how you split that out and the individual programs, it's, you know, we have, well, between Pat and I in, with, in the nursing pipeline, we probably have a couple hundred students. Right, right. It really depends so much on the program and on, um, um, but I would say, you know, the 5,000 students that are at VTC this year, I mean, at CCV this year, are all here or primarily here to get a job or a better job. And we serve 95% Vermonters. So they're here and they're gonna be here. Well, and just to um, piggyback on what the governor said, we're very pleased to have the biggest apprenticeship, plumbing and electrical apprenticeship class in a long time ever, I guess, at this point. And they're part of over 3,000 students we serve annually through our continuing ed and workforce development division. And then we have enrolled roughly 1,400 students in our degree program. So there's a lot, but it's not meeting the entire need. So we're delighted at the volume. But what I hear from employers, they love our graduates, they love the product for, through the training, there just aren't enough people going through it. So um, if you want a good job and you want to make good wages, you need to come and look at some degree, be it certificate, associate, or otherwise, and then you can launch your career through CCV or Vermont Tech. So, so that's the path. If you're a high school graduate and you don't know what you want to do or what your options are, you come to VTC first or you approach the employer first? Or what's your counsel to? wavering high school graduates? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Stuart. And it really depends on where you're at. Um, if you can afford to come to college, um, that would be recommended. But more and more students are getting a job and having the employer help them pay for their education, as, as illustrated here today. And I think that's becoming more and more a trend for the younger generations who are a little more debt adverse. 
but it really depends on where your mean, what your means are and where you are at personally, to your point, what 18-year-old really knows for sure. And sometimes you gotta get out in the workforce a little bit and find out where your niche is, and then you can come back and get a more focused degree. And we have multiple adult learners. Um, Jay Fayette, uh, the president of PC Construction, was, he tells a great story about, uh, got out of high school, got a job in construction, loved it, thought, here we go, until he got laid off two winters in a row and said, I can't do this anymore. And, came back as, I believe, 22 or 23-year-old student, got his degree, and the rest, as they say, is history. So each person has to decide what's right for them. I don't know if you yeah. want to add. No, that. I would just say that I think that's right. And oftentimes, we have people who come in and out. They get a degree. They get a certificate. They go to work. They get a job change. They get an upgrade. Um, we did a program um, with, uh, oh, the manufacturer in, uh, in uh, Colchester. I'm trying a complete uh, blank. Baptist? No, um, it'll never. It will, hey, but we'll no, um, it, yeah, the other one. It was <laughs> some of it, the other one. It, it right. is. I mean, the the <laughs> president of the company has a has a theme. The more you learn, the more you earn. Right. And so I think you know we are finding what we're finding with adult students is they come, they get a few courses, they get a job, then they want something more, or they want a promotion, then they come back, they get more, they get that promotion. So it's it's an in and out. Um, I think that's uh, that's the underlying message in, in many ways. It's never too late. Uh, and what I've seen, I've had the opportunity uh, to, to speak and attend uh, the graduation at CCV in particular. And you can see uh, the, the wide range of students who are graduating from there, anywhere from 19 to 81. 81. <laughs> um, and so, and you can see how hard they've worked to get to where they are. And the same with the apprenticeship program uh, with the plumbing and electrical down at VTC. I've been, I've been part of that for a number of years. And they don't just, you know, they don't go and, 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 uh, uh, and take these classes during the day. They come at night. I mean, they work all day. And then they come at night uh, to further their career. So uh, they have skin in the game, each and every one of them, and it's meaningful to them. Uh, but there's light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and they're able to, uh, to, to, you know, further themselves and, and make more money, to be perfectly honest. Other questions on topic? All right. Well, this is the point where I asked Jesse uh, to come up and Sydney to come up and, and uh, take all the rest of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get hired. Yeah. You're free to get out of the picture if you want. You're welcome to stay right where you are, uh, but there'll be some other questions that you may or may not want to be in the background. For. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Governor, the, um, you expressed a concern for public safety after the Jenny County State's Attorney dismissed a couple of pretty high profile murder charges uh, over uh, issues of insanity. And uh, Attorney General Donovan has refiled first degree murder charges in a case involving a Cleaver attack in Burlington. Do you greet that with relief or pleasure or what? Well, none of the above in right. some respects. Um, I'm very uh, grateful uh, the Attorney General took another look. Um, we uh, obviously have some opportunities to do things differently. I, I think we're going to have discussions about this uh, in the future in the legislature uh, in, in terms of you know, how we go through the judicial process. So I'm, uh, I'm just grateful that he is uh, taking a look at these three cases. Uh, and uh, and what uh, I didn't know that there was anything public at that uh, on this issue uh, in particular, but I'm just uh, thankful uh, that he was able to to move forward and look forward to the other two cases as well. Can and you, what his response will be? Did you define what a reform would look like? Well, n no. I mean, I, I think that there's uh, and again, I'm not uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but uh, I think that uh, we have to determine. Uh, what it is, you know, I've, I've made this statement before uh, in the past, and, I, and it was something that I borrowed uh, from Governor Shumlin in one of his State of the State addresses. And he said, we have to figure out, you know, who we're, who we're mad at and who we're afraid of, uh, and then distinguish between the two. Uh, and there are cases, uh, I believe, where uh, we're afraid of, of people uh, who should be 
uh, e either brought to, to justice. Uh, and if there's, um, if there's an opportunity uh, where they may uh, be able to work around uh, justice in some, some way, then we need to close that loophole. So again, uh, I think that uh, using uh, an insanity uh, defense is becoming more prevalent, it appears, uh, and, uh, and we need to figure out uh, how do we close that and, and how do we make sure that we're uh, truly uh, seeking um, justice for, for those, the victims, and, and uh, their families. What message does it send to the elected prosecutor that uh, uh, the Attorney General second, second guesses her judgment? Uh, that's probably a better question for her. Uh, obviously, she uh, had determined she was doing everything she could, uh, and uh, and we'll see uh, what the the attorney general uh, uses as uh, a defense and and where he goes from here. On the topic of the attorney general, have you spoken to him about the recent um, Purdue Pharma lawsuit? I, I have not. You plan to? Um, I just read about that myself, uh, so uh, I yeah I, I would like to see what he thinks. Does Vermont deserve a share of the uh, Sackler fortune? Um, this is going to be much like the tobacco settlements uh, that we've seen in the past. Uh, this will be, I believe, uh, we'll see in many states uh, that will uh, seek restitution, uh, and rightfully so. Um, the Fremont Care Board's uh, we, we talked about the uh, commercial health insurance uh, double-digit premium increases for next year. Neither of the insurance companies have appealed that, so those are will take effect now. The hospital budgets, including the big one for UVM, is going up well over the Green Care Board's cap. Um, just, what's this? Yeah, the, there's a, there is a difference again uh, between the cap uh, and the the amount of revenue that they can derive. And the rates, uh, and they're two separate issues. So I think it's uh, it's important uh, to to make sure that we separate those two, uh, because in in some respects, um, increasing the cap um, doesn't necessarily mean uh, there's a, there's a, it costs more for the rates. Um, so the rates were, I believe, the Greenmont Care Board uh, had come to the conclusion they should n not go any further uh, than 3.5% uh, for the rates. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, health care costs in general, and what we need to do uh, long term is to change our demographics. I mean, we're, we're hearing it, we're seeing it. Um, we have a, uh, an aging demographic, uh, which usually uh, um, leads to more utilization. Uh, and I think we're seeing that uh, in real time. So uh, the more we can, uh, the more we can do to bring more families, uh, younger, healthier population into the state, I think will be beneficial for healthcare costs. And as well, uh, going, you know, we're, we're moving uh, away from a fee for service and going uh, to a more holistic approach and trying to, uh, to make sure that we contain costs and, and work on prevention in other areas uh, where we believe we will have the, the most uh, opportunity to, to lower costs in the future. But it's a long-term approach. The Green Mountain Care Board wrote a letter to you saying one of the things that we need in order to move forward with health care reform is a bigger commitment from the state towards Medicaid funding and towards delivery system reform dollars. Um, what do you think of the argument they made to you in that, in that letter, and, and will you respond with the increased their right. I, I did respond uh, to their to their letter. Uh, I disagree uh, with some of their contentions, uh, and I stated why in, in the letter. And I believe that uh, you know we have made a lot of uh, commitments, and, and uh, we've done a lot in terms of, of increasing uh, Medicaid uh, reimbursement. So uh, it's not as though we've we've been you know cutting back. We've actually made some gains, and we're seeing uh, the utilization rate of uh, the caseload has, has dropped in Medicaid as well. So some of, you know, in the letter I showed why I believe um, that uh, we're doing, uh, doing a lot in that area and uh, why I'm not sure that their argument was correct. So we'll see where they go from here. But we're willing to, to talk about this, work with, you know, this isn't a unilateral decision on my part. 
Um, this is a legislative process as well. Uh, we'll work together with the Green Mountain Care Board, the legislative leaders, my administration, to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that uh, we're reimbursing uh, as much as we can uh, and uh, by and keeping uh, health care costs overall uh, confined. But you've got private health care, private health insurance premiums on the exchange going up 10 to 15 percent. You've got hospital budgets going up 5 percent, 5.9 percent in the case of UVM. Well, that, I, I, okay, but that's, that's the revenue, right? That's the cap on and, the revenue. And then you've got annual increases in Medicaid, state's share of Medicaid going up 0.9%. So how can you reconcile the disconnect between those rates of increase? Well, again, we've, uh, we've been working on this new approach, the all-payer model, uh, trying to, to uh, curb uh, the, the usage, uh, the utilization, uh, and that's going to take some time. But, uh, but again, my contention is that uh, we've been doing a lot in that area. In fact, the caseload has uh, decreased over over the last few years. So I think that's positive news. On demographics, uh, a new GFO report just came out saying that on, on, uh, that wealthy folks are not moving away from Vermont um, because maybe tax policy, but it's actually lower income and middle income folks who are, who are migrating away from the state. Uh, does that surprise you at all? Well, the data is the data. Uh, obviously, uh, this is, uh, doesn't surprise me. Anecdotally, I know uh, a number of, of folks uh, that uh, that I've been close to that have moved away from the state. Uh, blue collar workers, those uh, with low and moderate incomes uh, that have decided to move away uh, from Vermont. Uh, mainly what I hear uh, is property taxes. Uh, that's what I hear uh, most. Uh, and, um, and so it's not a surprise. The affordability of, uh, of Vermont is in question. Uh, and that's why we're doing everything we can to make Vermont more affordable and to bring about uh, filling those uh, those work uh, uh, those openings in our uh, workforce uh, that uh, that would help obviously in some of our revenue uh, issues that we have in the affordability of the state. Uh, President Trump called his Republican challengers, of which I guess there are three, um, a laughing stock this week that he would not attend in the Republican primary debate. Um, uh, do you think they're a laughing stock? Uh, are you looking at any of them? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't characterize any of them as laughing stocks. Uh, they've, uh, there's at least two governors, uh, former governors, uh, that have uh, moved forward uh, who were uh, popular at one time in their states enough so that they were elected. So I, uh, I think it's unfortunate. That, uh, that we don't have the, at least uh, the dialogue uh, about, uh, and, and primaries are, are not easy. I, I get that, I've had a couple of myself, and, uh, but it's, uh, it's important uh, for the people uh, to hear different perspectives and different points of view, uh, and uh, it makes you a better candidate in the, in the end. The, is it important for Republicans to have that dialogue? Yeah. I think it's important for um, all the electorate uh, to, to hear. Uh, different points of view. I think it's really important. Uh, you've reached out to Senators <coughs> McConnell and Graham uh, regarding guns. I guess, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with that? I think it was important uh, for us to share our story, and me in particular, uh, coming from a, I'm a Republican in a fairly blue state, uh, and, it, and I had a change of heart, uh, as we uh, well know. And I thought that uh, in this time and place, uh, sharing my thoughts, uh, sharing our story uh, was important uh, to share with fellow Republicans. So I thought it was important for me to, to add my voice. And speaking about the Senator's office this morning, it seems like he's kind of waiting to see what the President will or will not sign. Do you think that's a good approach or do you think they should get started on their end? Well, obviously, I think there's some common sense solutions uh, here uh, that we've implemented, uh, red flag legislation. Uh, I believe uh, increased background checks. I think those are two areas where I think we can make significant gains in terms of safety uh, for for Americans and for Vermonters. So uh, I I think we should move forward, and and I I think it's unfortunate that we haven't done so already. Um, just on the on the Medicaid issue, and we hear a lot of uh, conversation on the other side about Medicare for all. Here, it again tonight. 
Wouldn't in, in some ways Medicare for all solve a lot of problems for governors like you? Yeah. Well, it may solve some problems, but um, I'm not sure that it's the answer. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't believe that, I think we have to be realistic uh, about this. So it sounds good. Uh, free health care sounds good, but somebody's got to pay. I mean, there's, there's obviously uh, areas where um, we can improve. That's what we're trying to do. The all-payer model is something that we've been working with the federal government on. And, uh, and we're proving that, uh, that we can make some gains uh, in that area. And I think we'll see some long-term gains as a result. So uh, I, would, uh, I would much rather uh, continue to work uh, the way we have in Vermont. Uh, but, um, but again, uh, that's, these primaries are opportunities for people to, to uh, talk about uh, different perspectives and, uh, and flush those out and see who's going to pay and how, mu how much, what do they think it's going to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. Any response to hearing the Trump administration's plans to push for ban on e-cigarettes, flavored e-cigarettes? Well, as you uh, probably know, uh, in my State of the State address, uh, as well as the budget address, uh, we, uh, we, I took a position on this, and I think that this is uh, something that's very concerning to me, as we've seen the escalation of uh, our youth using uh, vaping products uh, throughout our, our state and country. Uh, it's time for us to take action. We took action in a different way. Uh, and I applaud uh, the president for uh, at least talking about this. We'll see where he goes with this at this point. Uh, but I think he's, uh, he's moving in the right direction. Will you be uh, in Burlington next week uh, if the timing is holds and the first F-35s arrive? I, well, I hope to be, sure. Uh, I look forward to the F-35s arriving in Vermont. and. And uh, as soon as I get a, a firm date, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm in hopes of being there. Over the last uh, couple of months, I think Border Patrol had had maybe three checkpoints in San Hero, another one down at River Junction. Uh, you, should Border Patrol be able to be detaining Vermonters and other um, residents uh, miles upon miles away from the border? Yeah, you know, there's been some talk about, I think uh, Congressman Welch has talked about uh, tightening that, maybe it's uh, Senator Leahy, I'm not sure. Well, the congressional delegation has talked about uh, confining that to 25 miles from the border. Uh, I would like to see us, uh, you know, tighten that up a bit uh, myself. Uh, 100 miles seems uh, a bit excessive. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, they have a job to do. Uh, they're working within uh, their limits. Uh, but um, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing the congressional delegation uh, work forward, uh, look forward to uh, um, changing uh, that that number of uh, miles. Have you ever gone through one of those? I have. Mm -hmm. uh, I was down, I went through one on uh, 91 uh, outside of Hartford. Did you give you a hard time? No, it was very quick, actually. Uh, this was something a few years ago, actually. This wasn't recent. Uh, so this is, shows you how long it's been around. It's not just this administration. Uh, this was probably five or six years ago. Uh, and uh, and I, was thought for, I, I was surprised to see it. I saw the signs, and I didn't know what, what it was, and I came up to it, and they stopped me and asked me if I was a, a U.S. citizen. I said I was, and they said, have a good day. Mm -hmm. and moved on, but it was right in the middle of the interstate, and I thought it was, Just it was odd. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you.